So um, on Wednesday, y'all, we get to finally order y'all um, the school of quizzes that we can give you guys to see if you're really learning this stuff. Um, the quizzes are like every three or four pages. And then, of course, after a section is done, we have a full-blown, real 50-item test, just like on the real thing, okay? And that's how we start seeing how you guys are learning. Um, how many of y'all made it here for the summer meeting? Okay, a couple of y'all. All right, I feel bad because I'm going to kind of go back and review some of the summer stuff then and uh, with you guys just to kind of make sure that you guys have it. We even had a little... Um, we had a Quizlet game or something that I made um, for it, and I have a Jeopardy game as well. I think the Jeopardy game was the, the first one. Now, we don't have our buzzers with us. Um, I'm going to have to try to get those back from Dr. B, maybe, for some of that. Um, let me see what we got here on the Dropbox. Okay. French and Indian War. What do we got here, Bob? It's a big book. All right, let me. Okay, so my apologies for kind of reviewing. My apologies for reviewing some of this. And um, one of the things I'm going to try to do, I was working on this all afternoon um, after lunch and everything. I'm finding some videos for you guys uh, that will kind of get us all get settled. Um, okay, why is that not opening? Oh, here it is. Okay. And we'll go through. Open up PowerPoint. Come on, baby. You can do this. All right. So, the other thing I need to get from Dr. V, y'all, is um, I'll need to get social studies packets. Do you guys all have the social studies packet? Anybody not have it? Anybody not have the social studies? You don't have yours? Okay. You don't have yours? You don't have yours. Okay. You never got it or you did? I have it. I have it at home. Okay. All right. Always try to bring that because we really do prefer you guys to write it physically on it, although... Are you saying that you you do better when you physically when you mark it online? Okay, um, you guys kind of know how it, what works best for you guys. Um, you know, I like I still like to print stuff out and mark it up, and that's why we have books for you guys. Um, if you don't have yours, you can go to Schoology. Are all of y'all signed up on Schoology that don't have it? Yay nay, because if you go to Schoology here, let's go to Schoology. And find ACT Act. Those of you that don't have it, that is. And I can get the link for those of you. Let's see here. Where are we at? Oh, wrong one. I got to look at the right courses. Okay. You'll know you're at the right spot for... Um, for the social science, well, not just social science, but for ACDEC, y'all, when you see the American flag. You see the American flag, you know where you are, okay? Notice on this, y'all, we have a, a series of stuff posted. You can always find your, your readings here. We'll be using this to post a lot more, okay? Um... Let's see here. Here's my little PowerPoint. I actually can probably pull it up from there. It might be a little bit different. I'm not sure. Huh? Okay, let me get you the link. All right. I'll read the link out loud. It's B as in Bravo. Z as in Zoo or Xena. B is in Bravo. N is in November. Then a hyphen. Then Bravo. B is in Bravo. S is in Sierra, D is in Delta, 9, and dash, Z is in X, I mean, excuse me, X is in X-ray, B is in Bravo, H is in Hotel, S is in Sierra, V as in uh, Victor. Let me try to make that bigger for you here, okay? 
trying to remember how do I make stuff bigger. There we go. Okay. All right. Come on, where's the link? There we go. I don't know if y'all can see that. Everybody's got it? Yeah. Okay. See if it works first. Is, is it working there, Jacob? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So anyway, let's make that small again. All right. If you go under there, I do have some videos for y'all. But also, uh, here is the link to the PowerPoint if you want to download it. Um, I'll try to always record these lectures because I realize some people can't make them. And, you know, they're just so doggone good. You guys may want to watch them like 50 times. Show them to your friends and enemies. But anyway, so I, <laughs> so I do have those for you guys. Anyway, so where is the SoSci packet? Why isn't it under here? The materials. Oh, that's right. I think she's got materials in a different spot. Let's see here. Where did she put those? Add materials. Let's see. Let's look at materials. All right. Why isn't there my SoSci packet here? Oh, there it is. Okay. Those of you that don't have it, look under the yellow folder for SoSci. And then look here. And you'll get the resource guide. Now, remember... And you'll hear me say this a lot this year, again and again. This is the official, I keep hearing talking, but this is the official guide, right? This is what you guys have photocopy. I will share lots of information with you, even extra stuff that's not in here to kind of make connections. And I may even correct some of the wrong stuff in here. But this is essentially the Bible, right? What you memorize as much of this as you can, and you'll be getting 900s and perfect scores on these tests. Remember, a 900 is equivalent of a 90. A uh, 1,000 is equivalent of a 100 on these kind of tests. Even if it's wrong, remember it, because that is what the questions are going to be. Sometimes they send corrections to us. This whole packet is only 96 pages, but really it's only 80, because the last part of it is timelines and stuff. It's got the little table of contents here. You guys have uh, copies of this. Those of you that didn't bring yours today, bring them next time um, or, you know, follow us along online today. Um, and you notice it doesn't really officially start till page five with this introduction. Now, a lot of people like to skip the introductions. They get, ah, it's nothing important there. Do read the introductions. Remember, if it is in this guide, it can be asked. Now, they're not going to be crazy, though, y'all, and do stuff like this. If you get to the very, very end of it, you know, they've got a ridiculous amount of footnotes and that. They're not going to ask you about the footnotes. Now, if there's information in the footnotes, like some additional information, that could be useful. Also, y'all, don't blow off the pictures. Now, up to this time in Act Act, we have never, ever had them have pictures in SOSI and ask you to identify. But there's always that first time. And they kind of started doing a little bit of that on Super Quiz, at least in economics this year. So there's always that chance. And remember, oftentimes the stuff underneath the pictures just say the same thing that's in the text. But occasionally there might be some additional information. So don't just like, oh, cool, got a big picture. Skip that next page. Read it, highlight it, take the notes on it, or whatever you need to do. Okay? Now, they get the revolution all done in the first 40 pages, y'all, which leaves the other 40 pages to be about the creating the revolution, creating the new nation, that is, writing the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, then it gets into the Treaty of Paris, winning the war. It gets into finally um, uh, the, winning the war, but then also what we call the critical period. The time, y'all, from the end of the revolutionary fighting in 1781 until the adoption of the Constitution in 1787. Those six years, y'all, will be known as the critical period because we nearly failed as a nation, most people say. And it's going to mean we're going to have like a rebellion called Shays Rebellion that you guys will learn about. 
And um, the result, y'all, is going to be the writing of something that you and I know and love called the Constitution, right? And then that's going to be followed up by the, the election of Washington as president for two terms by the Electoral College. Washington, y'all, won unanimously. He got every single electoral vote, right, from, you know, he got one. Like, in those days, you could vote. You had to vote twice. Um, and so Washington got one electoral vote from everybody. He's president for eight years, and then his successor will be John Adams up there. He's only president for four years. And then in 1800, we will see a controversial election. I'll talk about that in just a sec called the Revolution of 1800. That results in Thomas Jefferson becoming president. Now, it may not seem like a big thing, and maybe until January 6th, it didn't. It wasn't a big thing. But the United States established this tradition in 1800 of peacefully transforming power to the other people. People didn't riot or protest or kill the new leader or anything like that. I mean, Adams was ticked off, y'all. John Adams, he and it, what had been one of his best friends, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson had been his vice president when Adams was president, y'all. Um, they have a parting of the ways over politics. I mean, have y'all ever lost a friend like over politics? I mean, I hope not, but some people do. Their friendship was destroyed by politics. Now, later when they're older and they're not in politics anymore, they come back together as friends, but they don't really meet. They just write letters back and forth, what they call epistolary intercourse. Didn't they die on the same day? Huh? Didn't they die on the same day? And they died on the same day. Exactly. And what did Jefferson, um, what did, uh, no, what did Adam say when he died? Thomas Jefferson lives. Thomas and Jefferson lives. But he didn't know that Jefferson actually died earlier in the day. And it seems like a purely coincidental thing that they died on July 4th. But in fact, y'all, um, this was a, not any July 4th. This was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of the Independence being adopted on July 4th, right? And so Jefferson was literally willing himself, y'all. Um, this is gross to talk about. But um, his, his, like, um, everything was just failed, especially downstairs, right? And you guys ever heard of a catheter? Yeah. Catheter is a thing they put right up into your urethra, right? Where you go to the bathroom, number one, not number two, right? And they actually had one made of leather because they didn't have the fancy tubes and stuff we do today out of plastic or whatever. That had been inserted up as your read for y'all. All of this to try to keep the poor dude alive. And, you know, and Jefferson, if I'm not mistaken, like his last words are, is it not what I get? You know, he willed himself. And I'm sure Adams did. Now, Adams was an older guy. Adams until, um, who was it passed in? Jimmy Carter. Adams was our oldest president, as far as oldest in being alive after his presidency. He made it into his 90s, I think. Um, and so, but he also willed himself there. Now, our fifth president, James Monroe, he also died on July 5th, 24th. And so he's our fourth, fifth president, but July on July 4th. So I really think all former presidents should be required to, to die on July 4th. If they don't, we should help them. Like, hey, dude, you're getting kind of old. You're probably not going to make it to the next July 4th, so... Yeah, here you go. Just give you a little shot, right? And and put you out of there. So, anyway, um, so uh, that's where the history ends. But what they do, y'all, in this is they talk about different things. A lot of it is going to be where the political revolution. What happens as far as with um, you know everybody knows or we think we know we know about the fight, right? Fighting and all shooting and killing to win the Revolutionary War, the battles. They do all that, y'all, in about 20 pages, from about page 20 to page 40. Then, from about page 40 or so on, they talk about the political revolution. How did we govern ourselves? What did we have to do? How did we elect people? How did they serve and everything like that? What role did different groups play? So if we look at this opening here, let's, let's go to the first pages. I'll pull it up on here. All righty, y'all. And I hate to kind of review from this summer, but since only a handful of you were actually here this summer, and it's not bad review for y'all. Let me um, go through. 
Okay. All right. I'm going to make this big. All right. Now, how do you guys usually take notes? Do y'all write stuff down? Do you do Cornell notes? Uh, no, no, no. No, I'm thinking about Cornell notes. Okay. The trauma. Um, I mean, the way I did it, and it worked for me, but man, a lot of y'all are really great organized people, is I, I just write down as much as I possibly can that the guy's saying usually. Um, y'all have it right in front of you, the reading. But do make a point, you know, a lot of people like to do it with, okay, the people, people I need to know, all right? Dates I need to know, terms and definitions I need to know. Some people like to go through and highlight those things in different colors. All the people may be pink, right? You know, or whatever. Um, all of the dates, I don't know, maybe orange or something. Um, maybe all of the terms, maybe green or something. I don't know. Come up with the system. And it'll really help organize it. And you know what? I got a special gift for the people who are here today. Now, if you already got one because you're in the class, let me know. Here you go. There you go. All right. Yeah, man. You can fill this up. Yeah. Now, the people in my class, I gave them to already. Those of you at home watching this, this is what they're getting. See what you missed for not being here today, people at home? You already got one. You got one, Martin, right? You got one. Did you get one? Awesome. You what? Awesome. Here you go. Yep. Here you go. Need one? You got one? Need one? Awesome. <laughs> We're gonna to try to order some more of these. Okay, who else? All right. Everybody got one? Yes, it's yours. Isn't it cool? And it won't tear up like a lot of them. All right. So. Have important contacts in the back. It's got a calendar. That's pretty cool. Important contacts. You can write all your favorite team members. <laughs> all right. I'm glad I remembered that, y'all. Um, that's my chance to give you something. Dr. D will have plenty of cool stuff for y'all. All right. So. As we go through this, y'all, I'm gonna, I mean, I, I hate to kind of read it to you, but it's my only way to make sure that you guys get this. And oftentimes, I know these most successful decathlon teams, they actually read it all in class and would take turns reading. And I know that's dull as you know what, but it is important. Now, the first term here, be aware of this, maybe make a note of this. It says the War for American Independence. That's the same thing as the American Revolution, right? Now, the name of the term is fairly important. You know, I can see this as an essay question. To what extent was the American uh, events between 1775 and 1783 a revolution or a uh, war for independence? Was it more just to get independence from Britain or was it really to flip things over and have a revolution and change society? And we'll look at ways society changed in the last section, but we're also going to look at how they stayed the same, right? Now, so the War for Independence, remember, a.k.a. the American Revolution, begins as skirmishes. That's a word you guys will see quite a bit, skirmishes. That means just they're not really big enough to be a battle. We're not talking thousands of men shooting at each other. We're talking a few dozen, right? So we have these skirmishes between British troops and colonial militiamen. Militiamen, and I said this in class today, militiamen, y'all, remember, those are not professional soldiers. They are, like we today have, National Guardsmen. National Guardsmen, they train sometimes one weekend a month, maybe one month a year. They'll actually get, so they're not professional soldiers. And I'll be honest, they're not as good as professional soldiers. It's great that we have them. That's awesome. But this is what America had to fight a lot of the war with. 
is basically citizen soldiers, people who had normal lives. They had a gun in their um, in their closet when they rang the bells or whatever. They came running out. They did their fighting, and they went back home and you know had a nice cold one. Well, if they had cold, but anyway, it begins what state? Massagit down Massachusetts in 1775. It's April 1775. There's your first date. Okay, April 1775 is when the revolution begins. That's important because if you ask a lot of semi-intelligent Americans when the revolution started, they'll say July 4th, 1776. Man, everybody knows that. Never even been there. But it's not true. We fought, y'all, for almost a whole year before we had a revolution. And what's interesting is, and it's true, y'all, I, I was mentioning this in, in seventh today as well, too. The revolution obviously starts here in America as a small little thing. But like the French and Indian War, it spreads to Europe and ultimately spreads to the, to the world. You know, we, we're kind of like all full of ourselves. And we think, yeah, the only two world wars, yeah, they've been in our time, in the 20th and 21st century, right? But in fact, y'all, the French and Indian War, which morphs into the Seven Years' War, the American Revolution, which morphs into this World War, they were World Wars, too. They just don't get the credit that our wars do. I guess we didn't come up with that cool name, World War. All right. Now, this war, y'all, is more than just Americans versus British. Oftentimes, when you ask people, who are the sides in this war? They will say British versus Americans. And, okay, yeah, sorry, I'm thinking of the War of 1812, yeah. Oh, yeah, but they forget the French, you're right. They forget that, British versus the Americans, but people forget the Native Americans. They're caught in the middle here, y'all, and I hate to say this about Native Americans, it, but they don't pick the winning side usually. They got really bad luck. You can kind of tell who's going to win a war by saying, all right, what side is the Native Americans voting against? Okay, you know, who do they think is going to win? All right, the other side's going to win. Okay, to bless their hearts, they picked the wrong side. France gets involved. Spain gets involved. And even the Dutch, you know, per peripherally and all that kind of stuff. So, but a better way to look at this war, y'all, is between the loyalists and the patriots. Between the loyalists and the patriots. The loyalists can also be called Tories. Okay, it's, an, it's a nickname for the conservative political party. Now, the thing is, y'all, you had people over in Britain, the Whigs, W-H-I-G, who supported Americans. So when we say this is Americans versus the British in the Revolution, it's not all British people, okay? Americans targeted the king, and they targeted those <laughs> members of the Tory party who supported the king. Americans needed friends over there. So the Whigs, but at the same time Americans were fighting here, not all Americans were united either, y'all. Um, there were Americans, particularly in the South, particularly in New York, that were um, what we call loyalists. They stayed loyal. Now, had the revolution gone differently and the British won, those people would have been rewarded and would be our heroes in our textbooks today. But they picked the wrong side. The British lost. And so these people are today seen as sort of traitors, right? But, and a lot of them lost their property. A few of them lost their lives, but it wasn't like the French Revolution where we went crazy and killed everybody. But the Loyalists, y'all, a lot of them had to go to Canada, eh? or they went down to the Caribbean. Uh, I was in the Bahamas this summer, and I was also in Turk and Caicos Island, um, and uh, there were a lot of the Loyalists went there. You know, they basically weren't welcome in America anymore. Uh, because they picked the wrong side. And so it was kind of neat. We saw some buildings that some of these loyalists had moved to because they basically lost everything. Um, and, you know, and then you had those people, y'all, that were neutral. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie The Patriot. Um, and it's got some real issues. But The Patriot does try in some ways because it tells the story of this guy and he tries to be neutral. He doesn't want to be for the British. He doesn't want to be for the Americans. He just wants to be left alone and have his farm. But, of course, he gets pulled in, and he has to pick a side. And so, you know, that was the deal. So we got to realize there were, in some ways, y'all, three sides. Loyalist Americans with their British allies fighting the American patriots, 
okay, or patriots is how they said it back then. And then you have these neutral people trying to stay out of it there, okay? Lots of people in this war, and you guys will learn more of this, and these are perfect essay topics. You know, what role did women have? Women were very involved in this war, y'all. Not necessarily in fighting, although there's some great stories about women fighters. Um, Native Americans were involved heavily in this war, mainly on the British side. Once again, pick the wrong side. Sorry, guys. And then also African Americans. You know, some African Americans fought for the British. Some African Americans fought for the, the Patriots, okay? Sometimes they were freed. Sometimes they weren't, okay? Um, and that's a whole separate story that I'm sure you guys will you'll learn a lot more about, too. We had a Congress, a one-house Congress in those days, not like today where we have House of Representatives and a Senate. It was simply called the Continental Congress. And then once we get the Articles of Confederation done, it simply is known as the Congress. Our army was called the Continental Army. Not the American Army or anything, but the Continental Army. And, of course, all those people, y'all, hope that they would benefit from this revolution after Americans obviously wanted freedom. Um, women, a lot of them wanted more political rights. Others wanted independence and a chance to start over. Okay? Obviously, the United States is created out of this. And the United States, y'all, is the first modern constitutional democracy. You want a simple question. What's the first modern or what? term applies to the United States. We are the first modern constitutional democracy. Britain wasn't yet, y'all. And an important difference between the United States and Great Britain, even to this day, y'all, is that the British, if you ask for a copy of the British Constitution, good luck. It's like all the laws. It's the Magna Carta, which I got back over there on the thing in Latin. It's all kinds of different bills that have been passed. They don't have like an actual written document that explains how government works. We do, because we didn't trust that constitution anymore, right, that the British had. So we have a written constitution. The constitution leaves out some important things. So a few years after its approval, we get the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the constitution. Uh, James Madison, who was opposed to it, ironically ends up writing them, okay? And, of course, other documents here. And they codify it. And this is the thing, and I mentioned this this summer when we met. When you guys see a series, when you see a series of terms or people or words, make a little note because your lazy act deck tech question writers, y'all, and they have quite a few of those. I've written questions for Cathlon in the past and, um, and for those kind of competitions. When you see a series of things, you're like, oh. Cool. This is going to be an easy, none of the, or which of the following is not true. So always pay attention to that. Now, so it codifies ideals of equality, liberty, and fraternity. Now, this summer, I pointed out that I hate them doing that. Because when you and I hear about liberty, equality, and fraternity, what revolution do you think about? That's the French Revolution, right? Fraternity is brotherhood. Americans, we you know, yeah, we talk about equality, we talk about liberty, but I don't see that word fraternity being used much. But nevertheless, they add it here. Um, now, important to note, <coughs> revolution doesn't create a utopia. We've said that word before. Once again, what does utopia mean? A perfect place. You might know what it literally means in Greek, the word utopia. In Greek, it means no place or know where. Thomas More wrote this satire about what a perfect world would look like, and he called it Utopia. And the person who told the story was named Raphael Hitheldank, which in Greek means speaker of nonsense. Okay, it was my big 12th grade paper. I still remember that book, like the back of my hand. Oh, how'd I get that? Anyway, um, so, but the thing is, y'all, it did create a perfect Utopia. You guys know we're still struggling to try to be that country, right? I mean, when we wrote all men are created equal, it was pretty much white men, right? It was what we were counting on. But the white men now have expanded to be all men, now since the 20th century, all women, okay? And we're, we're working more and more to try to reach that ideal. 
But the thing is, and this is a great term for you guys to remember, um, politics is the art of the possible. You do what you can do at the time. Now, you and I, we look back and like, man, they should have counted Indians. They should have counted the women. They should have counted African Americans. What's wrong with these people? Don't they know their people? Well, they did the best that they could, okay, for the time. Had they tried to go too far, that might not have worked. But what has it been up to us to do? To try to be more inclusive and to encounter all those. And that's a possible question, too, that they could ask you. To what extent did the revolution live up to its ideals of equality and liberty? It did for some people, but a lot of people were left out of the whole deal. Okay, and then, of course, we'll get into this struggle to define what democracy is, what citizenship is, what individual rights are. Many key groups were not granted the rights that others got, right? And then here, y'all, they talk about the four sections. Now, hopefully, we will have for you guys, okay, I wish I could close this stupid thing over here. All right, close tools. All right. Ah, let me go back here to this thing. Why is it doing this to me? Social, so sorry. Here we go. Um, here we go. I'll pull it over here a little bit. Now, there are four sections. Not all Act Deck packets all work perfectly. The company we get our section test from always has five section tests. Trouble is, some of your packets might have seven sections, like music is notorious for it. This year, we only have four. So there's a chance, y'all, that one of those section tests will be part of another section. It'd be like, maybe section three will be divided into two section tests or something. So it won't go perfectly. The first part here, y'all, Revolutionary Origins, goes from the events, uh, you know, it says from the beginning all the way through the end of the Seven Years' War, okay? It takes you from Seven Years' War to finally the meeting of the First Continental Congress that's, that's called in 1775. This goes over the origins of the revolution, politics, economic, social, okay, that leads them to seek independence. The second one is literally the battles and stuff. You know, going over each battle is the second section. Now, the nice thing about this war, y'all, is it is divided nicely into what we call theaters of war. Um, you know, the war, y'all, didn't just all happen in all throughout the country at the same time. Well, it wasn't a country yet. All over the 13 colonies at the same time. It pretty much starts in New England, and then it kind of spreads into what we call the mid-Atlantic states, New Jersey and New York. And then you see a lot of fighting there, okay? And then it finally comes to what we call a stalemate where nobody's really winning or losing. That's a good term for you guys to know, a stalemate. If you guys have had world history already, you guys kind of know about World War I was a stalemate, right? They hardly gained or lost any ground. It was kind of crazy. That's kind of what the war becomes. So the British shall make a conscious decision. They're thinking, all right, we may not win this war. We got to try to save something for it. Right? you got to always get something out of a war or all that money, all those dead people will have died, money been spent for nothing. And so the British all really begin to concentrate on the southern colonies. And indeed, this is where the war ultimately is won for the Americans. Uh, anybody remember, or anybody know what, what is the last big battle seed to the war? Uh, Start to the Y, uh, Yorktown, right? The siege of Yorktown. October 1781. Spoiler alert. Spoiler, y'all. We win. We get our independence. I, I, I'm hoping I'm not spoiling for any of y'all. But yeah, we do get our independence out of this. And it happens at Yorktown, which is in Virginia on that little peninsula. Ironically, y'all, and it's cool how nature does this, not too far from Jamestown, where America began in 1607. How about that? Pretty neat, huh? So anyway, um, so there we go. Um, the third section is the political revolution. These are the events that created the United States and the first three presidential administrations. That is Washington, Adams, and Jefferson. Okay. You won't get a whole lot about Jefferson, but you do get, uh, Washington and Adams in a lot of detail. Then we get that election of 1800, which you guys should maybe start calling the revolution of 1800. 
because it's a it's a remarkable thing. Because in most countries of the world, y'all, when somebody didn't want to give up power, they fought to hung, hang on to it. You had fighting in the streets, and you had people, you know, attacking the, the capitals and the Congress. We did not have that, right? The closest thing, sadly, I hate to say, is what happened on January 6th, right? Um, when you saw people who were unhappy with the results storm into the Capitol, right? Trash some things. It was, it was embarrassing. Because we had not done that. We were the country that showed the world, hey, you don't do that. When somebody loses an election, you accept the results and you move on, right? And the other side, when they lose, what do they have to do? They have to accept the results. It isn't a one-way street. You don't get to say the election was illegitimate and say the other side can't when they lose, okay? And so the last section here, y'all, is the one that I personally think a lot of your essays are going to come from, and that is the social revolution. And that's where you get this thing. To what extent is this a real revolution? Who got the cool things that were being promised? Who was left out? Okay. To what extent is it a real revolution? To what extent is this just a war for independence? Or did we just change the names of the leaders and the faces of the leaders? And the poor people and other people just kept the same kind of situation. So all of that, y'all, I get from the first part here. Now, I think I did make a PowerPoint, but I've probably since I've got it somewhere. I might have posted it that I basically cut and pasted um, this, y'all, and kind of cut it down and trimmed it down. Um, so they open, as I do in my AP class, with the Native American people, right? And notice, too. I mean, you and I, we have this kind of, I call it a presentism disease, where we kind of think, didn't they know what we know today back then? Like, why did those people get on Titanic? Hadn't they heard about Titanic? Didn't they know it was going to sink? I mean, it's same Titanic. Well, you and I, you know, they didn't know that till April 5th, 14th, right, 1912. You and I, we know we win the revolution. We know that it happens. But if you're living during the time, it didn't seem inevitable. Okay, I think in some ways the Civil War maybe felt like it was inevitable to some people. But you and me, we see it as, well, hey, what was going to happen? These were just typical Americans who shared a lot of views from the Enlightenment. We'll talk eventually about the intellectual background of the revolution. You know, these people wanted social freedom. These people wanted individual liberty. They wanted economic prosperity. Now, here's a series. There's only three, though, so I don't know how useful that would be. But most historians agree, and boy, is that rare to say, y'all. Most of the time, we can't get historians to agree on anything except dates and stuff and, and names of presidents and things. But almost everybody believes that the revolution happened two to three decades before, okay? And largely, the war that makes the war for independence possible, this could also be a great uh Actic uh, essay topic is the Seven Years War, or as I really like to call it, because I think it's more appropriate to call it the French Indian War, because it happens here two years before it becomes that other war. All right, so remember that, but I could see a great question to what extent did the French Indian War lead to this? All right, Native American society before European colonization. They don't do a whole lot on that, but some basics here, y'all. Um, you and I, and I do this with my AP students, when you and I think of an Indian, most of us think what? The guy riding on a horse chasing buffalo, right? He's got, you know, he's using a bow and arrow, maybe a spear or something like that. And that's true for the Plains Indians. But the Plains Indians, y'all, aren't going to be involved in this. The Indians we're looking at are much more diverse, okay? These are Indians that are more sedentary. They build, I don't want to say permanent structures, they were made of bark and made out of wood, and they did sometimes move around and stuff, but a lot of them had crops. They had gardens or fields and things. They weren't like the Indians that you and I stereotypically think of. But a big problem that the Indians are going to have, y'all, and this is going, and if they want to be really fancy, um, one reason the Indians are going to always have issues is they weren't unified. Now, once again, those of us today that know how the story ends, what do we do? Well, we go, man, what was up with those Indians, man? 
you know, here these guys show up and they're obviously up to no good. And there's only like a hundred of them. Why don't you just attack them and kick their butts in the water and wipe them out? I mean, aren't you stupid? Don't you know what they're going to do? But the thing is, the Indians didn't see the Europeans necessarily as conquerors. They saw them as an opportunity. Native Americans were divided and fighting amongst themselves, y'all. And so the thing is, you know, they see these guys show up with really cool weapons and stuff. And they're like, oh, man, I don't want to be their enemy. I want to be on their side. And you know what? I bet you I can talk them into fighting against our enemy and turn them on our side. And so at least initially, y'all, Indians really thought they could use these colonists, whether you know they were Spanish. And indeed, y'all, a lot of the Indians in what is today Mexico, they got exactly that. They got the Spanish to help them and to defeat the Aztecs. I mean, there were a few things they agreed on, but almost all of them disliked the Aztecs, right? Because of the sacrifices and the Aztec tribute and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of these Indians are going to think the same thing. Like, oh my gosh, look at those cool weapons. Let's get them on our side. Now, the thing is here, let's look at some of the differences here. So there's no unified Native American identity. It wasn't like these are Indians and and a few times, like we'll see with Pontiac's war, you know, Indians do try to unite, but ultimately, y'all, all that bad blood, you know, starts to come up. They start turning against each other, and ultimately, they can be defeated. They never could really truly unite and come together. Um, Native groups spoke different languages. We think at least a thousand different languages, different religious beliefs. You know, not all of them believed in a great sun or or whatever, different customs and traditions. Now, here's something. Some were agriculturalists. They planted crops. They had fields. Mainly the crops, it's not on here, but the crops they tended to grow were corn, beans, and squash, the so-called three sisters. So they would grow these things together. Others, y'all, were much more hunters and gatherers. A key thing, y'all, is Indian men did the hunting and fighting and fishing. And the women did the planting. Very, very clear gender distinctions there. Okay? That's kind of one thing they did have in common. Some of them, y'all, lived pretty much just on the subsistence level where you didn't know if you are going to be finding food tomorrow. Life was, was difficult. Others were more settled and they had plenty of crops and stuff. Unfortunately for us, at least for the, you know, the English settlers, that's where we tended to land. Now, they did have conflicts. Don't ever believe Indians lived in peace with one another. They fought each other. Like I said, that's one reason they welcomed some of the Europeans to use them against their enemies. What were some of the reasons for fighting? Here you see a series. Territory. You know, we like to think that Indians didn't own land and in a way they did it, but they did use land. And if it's a good place and you can fish and there's lots of hunting there, other people are going to come and try to take it and you're going to fight them. Hunting practices, agricultural practices, different customs. These are all reasons they fought each other. Now, the big killer, literally and figuratively, y'all, is, of course, disease, right? When the Europeans show up, they're carrying diseases. And they've kind of gotten used to these diseases. It's not that they don't make them sick, but they usually don't die from them. George Washington, for example, had smallpox and left him with with pockmarked face that he had for the rest of his life. Maybe one reason he never was able to have children. That's right, the father of our country had no children um, himself. But anyway, y'all, the Native Americans did not have those kind of immunities. It was sort of like when COVID first showed up, you know, particularly your oldest people, uh, your least healthy people um, were the ones that got it. The big disease you guys need to know is smallpox. But there was also measles, diphtheria, all kinds of things. And it's important to understand how devastating this was to Native Americans. Because when the Indians, the, the ones most likely to die were the old. The old people, y'all, knew the stories. They knew the traditions. And uh, they were the wise ones. So... What, what you need? What do you need? Um, oh, okay. And I've got his application here. We don't want to lose this guy. I can tell already. So, um, not that we want to lose any of y'all. I'm just saying. You know what I mean? Um, but the thing is, um, 
So, but the wise people, y'all, they were devastated. And think about it. Think, we would probably do the same. Let's say you and I caught something, and it was like nothing for us. Like, <laughs> and COVID, that was like nothing. But we see all these other people dropping dead around us. We should start maybe feeling a little bit superior to them. Like, what's the deal here? These people were wusses. They're dropping like flies. Man, look at me. And it's really going to contribute to this feeling of superiority by the Europeans against the Indians. Here is your first data that you need. Or data. I never I get them all my stuff. 90%. That is the high ball number for the percentage of Native Americans who died. Some historians say it's less. Not many say it's higher. But we think as many as 90% of all Native Americans died as a result of disease. Not that many died of bullet, y'all, or starvation. It was disease, okay? And, of course, that had you know, all kinds of things. Now, like they said, they don't have time to go over all the diversity and all of that, but I definitely urge you to do that. And we will definitely talk more about Native Americans and their decisions. All right. Now, as I told you guys earlier, if you do see a picture, okay, don't just blow it off and like, cool, I don't have to read that. That's awesome. Okay. Here's our first picture. This is by the painter and leader of the colony of Roanoke that disappears. His name is John White. That's not on there. And this says it's a 16th century sketch. It was done around, what, 1585, 1584, probably. Sketch of the Algonquian village of Pumitoc in modern-day North Carolina. And it's so good that he did these sketches. And there are dozens of them, y'all. If you just look up John White watercolors, um, you'll see tons of them. But the only way we know a lot about how these Native Americans look because they got wiped out by disease and by war and stuff or they emerged is some of his paintings. It's like, you know, somebody going back in time and taking a photograph of like Roman times and we know what they look like a little bit. We can see how their huts were. They got a little central area here. He nicely shows us the sub, you know, kind of how they're constructed. So basically these were made out of animal hide jaw stretched over various um, wooden things, okay, like kind of a wooden frame, what we today would call a Quonset hut that the military often uses. So we see that. And so the first group of Indians, the ones mentioned up here, are the so-called Algonquian peoples. Um, I, have, I have this document on Schoology. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have that. Where do I go to see that, Dr. B? All right, Schoology. Yeah, that way they can follow along. If they, can, if they don't have it highlighted yet, they yep. can highlight it. Okie dokie. Yep. All right, so tell me which. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Annotation okay. Dr. V. And then, and then, oh, look at you. Yeah, open up the Yeah, it's, it's taking a bit. It's trying. Yeah, it good. All right, thank you, Dr. V. I know I'm hard to follow. Um, I had a system going for the people that are new. Okay. Uh, so, do you have that anywhere? Uh, Fourth page? Yeah. Yeah, All right, here you go. Yeah, so I use orange for people and places. Make it bigger here. Green for wars and battles, but you don't have to follow. Okay, so. What are y'all doing back there? Are y'all not listening to Dr. V? And then, pink as a savior for really important things. So, once, like, I'm not taking it here. So, yeah, pick your own colors, y'all. But, so, here you go. Dr. B is using orange for people and places. I suggested pink. But, um, wars and battles, green, I guess you could say, because they cost lots of money. Dates, blue, because if you don't get a date, you're going to be very blue and sad. And um, really important stuff is pink. Like, anytime they say, like, the most or the best. Or the, the greatest reason. The greatest or the only. I like that. So, you know, and I, oh, by the way, Dr. B, I passed out to them. Everybody was here. Got one of the notebooks. We still got two left. Did you need an extra one, Dr. B? No, I have one. Okay, cool. All righty. So, like I said, pick a system. And it helps a lot. And notice she also has tabs on hers. I think a lot of y'all did that. So this is what Dr. V's would look like. Let me blow yours up a little bit there, Dr. V. 
I'm blowing it up a little bit so they could see. Okay. Awesome. Right, now this will be in black and white though, just like y'all's are. Notice this, ninety percent. Yep. Okay. So the Algonquian people, y'all. These are the people, and they go by different names. This is sort of a general linguistic kind of name that we've given this area. Um, the Algonquian jaw are going to be different from the Iroquois. The Algonquian are those Indians that mainly supported the French, okay, like the Hurons and some of those. Now, the Indians, the English colonists first run into Jamestown, 1607, Plymouth, 1620, are, are jointly members of the Algonquians. Notice here what she's done. It's in pink. Most populous and widespread. They're one of the most. So be aware of that. Now, members of this group spoke this language related there. It doesn't mean that they were perfect. You know how we have like the Romance languages? Uh -huh. And, you know, if you're French, you maybe can understand a little Spanish, although I find Spanish and Italian are a little closer, yeah. right? Like, you know, when we went to Europe and when I was a junior, like some of y'all, um, our kids that spoke Spanish could get by in Italian, right? Um, so we have like language groups. Algonquin is a language group. Now, one of these, y'all, and you should know this, the tribe near Jamestown was the Powhatan tribe, or Powhatan tribe. Powhatan was the leader of what was loosely called the Powhatan Confederacy. He is the one who saved the colonists. And literally, his most famous daughter, Pocahontas, saves, um, you know, John Smith, supposedly. You also have the Pequots. Pequots were pretty much universally hated by everybody. I think the Pequots probably even hated themselves. Uh, but they were the man-eaters, right? They were cannibals. And that's why everybody hated them. Their name literally meant man-eater, okay? Then you had the Narragansetts who lived in modern-day Rhode Island, okay? And the Narragansett, y'all, were enemies of the Pequot and also enemies of some of those living up where the pilgrims lived as well, too. And this is why, once again, the Indians wanted to try to befriend the pilgrims and the Puritans to get them to help them against their enemies, the Narragansetts and the Pequots. Um, now, before the Europeans arrived, where did the Indians, at least the Indians that matter to us for the revolution, they lived along the Atlantic coast and particularly along the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes. Now, these people did, some of them, as you saw, live in huts, but a lot of them still hunted and fished, okay? There was good stuff there. Now, here you go. Dr. V has this uh, map of some of the tribes there. Now, I doubt they'd ever give you guys a full map and have you do it and, you know, like, what number would be here or whatever, but in your mind, this this should help. And I... I sometimes, you know, I read a lot of military history, and I don't know about you, but I get confused with the geography sometimes. So sometimes I may print out or copy a map, and I will put it separately somewhere so I can refer to it while I'm reading, okay? And that might not be a bad idea for Mr. D to do, is to make one of those. So notice we have this general group called the Iroquois, as we say in Canada, or Iroquois, as we say here. Here's the St. Lawrence River, and the Great Lakes, y'all, were basically like highways, except unlike Houston highways, you actually can move on them. You know, you're not stuck in traffic. So these five Great Lakes, Erie, Ontario, Michigan, Superior, um, and all of them, y'all, they, were, they weren't completely connected, but they were awfully close. But notice the Iroquois, y'all, here. There are one, two, three, four, five tribes. This is a perfect question for them to say all the following were leaders of the, or were members of the Iroquois Confederation or the League of the Iroquois, except here you go. You got the Seneca, you got the Cayuga, the Onondaga, the Oneida, and finally the one that's perhaps most famous, the Mohawks, because they had really cool hair. You know, the Is that Mohawks, where right? came from? Yeah. Yeah, supposedly. Interesting people, by the way. 
for whatever reason, they have like a really great sense of balance. And when we were building our first skyscrapers, Mohawks were great. They could go out there and walk on the beams like no problem and talk and all of else was like, mm. you know, so I don't know what the deal is, but that was a frequent vocation of them. And the thing is, y'all, just because the United States ends here doesn't mean these Indian nations end there too, especially like the Mohawk, they were on both sides. Okay. So make sure you guys are aware of them. Okay. Let's see here, y'all. Okay. Now. So these people grew things like we said, they, they, uh, they added to their food stores from hunting and fishing with things like squash. Okay. I mentioned corn. I mentioned also um, corn, beans, and squash, the so-called three sisters. Okay. Now, the uh, Algonquian y'all were also the first Indians that the French ran into. I think I told you all this story. Those of you who were here this summer, I don't want to belabor it or whatever, but it changed everything because the French y'all come in and they find the Algonquians, particularly the Hurons, and they befriend them. And the Hurons really quickly are like, hey man, those guns you got, they would kick butt against our enemy, the Iroquois. And so they convinced Samuel Champlain to help them in their war, the Hurons, against the Iroquois. And on the lake that now bears his name, he blew away a couple of these Iroquois chiefs. And also, the other, the Hurons attacked him. They cut him up. They would torture him, pulling their, you know, intestines out, burning off their fingers, pulling out tendons. If they were men, cutting off something near and dear us guys, and all that kind of stuff. Pretty, pretty doggone brutal. Okay? Yeah. Now, part of her... Paige, let me pull it over here, is cut off. Let's see, here we go. So we got corn, beans, and squash, three sisters. Perfect to know. All right, now in New England, the Indians that befriended the Puritans and helped them survive are the Wapanoags. Now their leader was an Indian by the name of Matasoit. You don't need to know that, but you got to know his son's name. His son's name was King Philip or Metacom. Now, what ends up happening, y'all, is Massasoit, he was cool with the Puritans, but his son began to get worried as they began to take more and more of the native lands. You know, they would burn out the soil really quickly, plus, plus their population was growing. And so the Europeans kept going further and further in. And Philip, y'all, or Medicom as he was known, he decides, look, we got to do something. And so he launches what's known as King Philip's Armeticom's War. It came close, y'all, to kicking the English out of what is today New England. But the same old problem, Indians fighting amongst themselves became the undoing. Philip uh, ultimately was killed by a shotgun blast, his head cut off, his, four arm, his two arms and two legs, uh, four appendages cut off. Um, and uh, sent to different parts, and his head was left on a pike for, for a long, long time for people to see. And his wife and children sold off into slavery. So make sure you guys know this. The Wapanoags under Metacomet or King Philip fought this war up in New England. Questions? I have questions. Yeah, go for it, man. How was that guy's slave? All his appendages were cut off. How does that work? Well, he was dead, and they got big swords, and they cut off his arms, they cut off his legs. They chopped off his head. Yeah, but that's not really slavery. It's like I didn't say slavery. Yeah, his children. Oh, his children and wife were sold into slavery. No, he couldn't do much being a slave at this point with the arms missing and legs and stuff. Yeah, wouldn't work too well. All right, the Iroquois, five nations that Dr. V mentioned, ultimately six. Okay, remember them. There they are. M O O C A S. Okay, what we get? We get Mooks. M O O. C.S. Mooks. Okay. If that helps you remember it. We don't know, but somewhere back in the day, they decided to stop fighting each other. And they created this uh, system that you'll hear more about later that some people think was sort of the suggestion for our Constitution. Their great law, as it's called, starts with these words. We the people. You may have heard that one somewhere before. But anyway, so they formed this group. Okay. Now, they did add a sixth one, as Dr. V says. 
Tuscarora. The Tuscarora become part of it. So, you know, now you've got the MOOCs. MOOCs, okay? But that would be a question. What was the last of the groups to add? Very easy question. Sometimes called the Six Nations, sometimes called the Five Nations, sometimes called the Iroquois Confederacy or the League of the Iroquois. If you just see the word Iroquois or Five Nations, you know what we're talking about there. All right. Now, the Iroquois, y'all, their homes, semi-permanent homes, were known as longhouses. As that picture showed you, and the Iroquois, y'all, even though they were enemies with the Algonquins that you saw, like the Pomacock that you saw in that other picture, they still built largely the same type of homes. Although one distinguishing feature of the Iroquois, as its name suggests, is longhouse. They were much bigger, 50 feet long sometimes, y'all. And sometimes multiple generations of families might live in the same thing. When you got married to a girl, if you're a guy, you went and lived with your female, uh, with your in-laws as the guy. You lived with the female side because this was a matriarchal society. Now, where did the Iroquois live? The Great Lakes in the northern part, upstate New York and Canada, eh? And as Dr. V highlighted here, here you've got some advantages for this location. Now, the Iroquois are inland, so they're kind of spared the initial hit that the other Indians get. They have some time to kind of observe and watch what the Europeans are doing, okay? Whereas those Indians right along the coast, like Powhatan's Indians and the Narragansett and some of those y'all, they got hit immediately and very quickly wiped out. This, is, this bought the Iroquois y'all some precious, precious time, their location. The second reason, y'all, is they were kind of right in the middle of the French, right in the middle of the English, and right in the middle of the Dutch. The Dutch area, y'all, that they settled is what is today kind of like the middle part of New York. Just go up the Hudson River and you see the Dutch colonists, but they eventually get kicked out by the English and won't be part of the story for long. As I said as well, y'all, the Great Lakes is another key advantage because... The Great Lakes, y'all, were like a highway that allowed them to go deep and move back and forth. It also allowed them to negotiate some real great uh, arrangements with Europeans. And this is a key thing that's going to be lost in the French and Indian War. The French and British, y'all, um, the French, yeah, they played, uh, they were played off against each other by the Indians. And I, and I don't mean to, you know, to, to be little, like any problems that some of y'all may have with parents or whatever, but. I look at sometimes divorced parents and I feel sorry for them in this sense because a smart kid can sometimes play them off against each other, right? Like, you know, hey, mom, did you hear what dad's getting me for Christmas? And then you say it, mom's like, that old dude, I'll get you something better, kid, because I love you more. And then you come back to dad, hey, dad, did you hear what mom's getting me? And it, you up the ante and before long, you know, your college and first car and marriage and Everything is paid for. So, um, but the thing is, once the French leave, you know, at the end of the war, y'all, the British were like, homie doesn't have to play that game anymore. Homie doesn't have to please the Indians. We'll give you what we want to give you. And that's it. Now, there's lots of contact. Of course, the contact with the Europeans is going to change the lives forever of a lot of these. But this is an important distinction that they make. We often look at it, y'all, as there's the Indians. Then the Europeans come and they wipe out the Indians and there's really no trace left of the Indians. But instead, y'all, we get what's often called this kind of middle ground, this area where a lot of things. So instead of, we, of getting us just a new European country or getting rid of the, in, uh, the Indian country, what we end up getting, y'all, is ones that feeded on each other's or fed, fed, fed on each other's. Um, Indians offered some technology, for example, like in some things like medicine. Canoes, y'all, Europeans didn't have anything like a canoe, okay? The Europeans, of course, offered technology as well, too. Guns, ammunition, sadly, also alcohol. Culture changes, you know, some Europeans adapt to that. Food ways, Europeans, this great Colombian exchange, Europeans adopt a lot of the food. And, of course, Indians, reluctantly, because they really hated those pigs and cattle and stuff that were brought over, but it changes their food ways as well, too. Political structures will be influenced by Indians. 
So here we see a series. Once again, what were the, some of the things that happened? Well, an exchange of technology, an exchange of culture, an exchange of food waste, an exchange of political structure. Boom. You got you a nice, easy set of questions there. All right, I got about five more minutes. Okay. Now, the European nations, y'all, I mean, they're, it's out of the province here to talk about, but all kinds of stuff were going on, religious wars and all of that. And Europeans were very quick to seize on this as a great new way to get wealthier. Okay, so by the mid-18th century, 1750s or so, Great Britain had colonies that went all the way along the eastern seaboard. So their colonies, y'all, were about the thinnest group, okay? They went down all the way from Maine. Got to remember, y'all, back in the day, Maine was part of Massachusetts. It stays that way until 1820 with the Compromise of 1820 all the way down to what today is Georgia. So ironically, y'all, except for the Dutch, the British had the smallest area, very, very densely populated. The New French, I mean, the French, y'all, what they called New France and what they called Louisiana, their territory was ginormous. Sounds like an advantage, but it turns out, y'all, it left them too spread out, and they could be picked off more easily by the British. So once again, this is another great example. And if they wanted to come up with, I just thought of this as a topic for geography, explain the role of geography in early, you know, the early American history here, because the French could be spread out so much, y'all. And notice this, this is somewhat of a surprise, but we'll look at it on a map here. <coughs> the French, y'all, they stretched as far as the Rocky Mountains. I'll show you that in a map just a sec here. So the French land claims vastly outweighed those of the British, okay? All right, let me go over here and see Dr. B's second column here. Um, and uh, in 1756, when the Seven Years' War starts, now, this is where I have a problem with how they do this. The war starts in here, y'all, as the French and Indian War in 1754. But it doesn't really get over to Europe and become a declared real war until 1756. So it's really a nine-year war here, but a seven-year war everywhere else. So once again, and man, I hate you just memorizing numbers that you will never ever use again after you leave the cap on, unless you're trying to impress somebody on a date. Like, hey baby, did you know that on the eve of the Seven Years' War, the British population stood at two million? Man, they'll just go crazy. So the British have two million. Look what the French have, y'all. 65,000. I mean, that is a big, big jump. Now, also, too, y'all, there's going to be some real problems between the French and the British. Okay? The new, the French, y'all, are Catholic. All right? And they don't quite have the democratic background like Magna Carta and all that kind of stuff and democratic assemblies and things that the British have. Okay? But the big difference is religion, okay? And the other thing you need to make a note of, y'all, too, the French, for different reasons, treated the Indians much better. It's no accident, y'all, that in the French-Indian War, most of the Indians are on the side of the French, very few on the side of the British, because the French were much more careful. Now, is that because the French people are better? Not necessarily. They didn't have the numbers or the power to compel the Indians. The British, having these numbers, they could be crappy to the Indians. But the French, y'all, because of their smaller numbers, they, um, they had to be nicer to them. Plus, the French didn't bring over their women. And so if they, you know, wanted to have families, they had to intermarry with the Indian women. And that's not going to work very well if you go around killing them all. So the French got along better with Indians. The French, y'all, were Catholic. The British, on the other hand, they're Protestant, particularly what we call Anglican. Now, in 15, was it 12 or whatever, Martin Luther, all that stuff, had started this Protestant Reformation, and the British had left the church under um, Henry VIII. Henry VIII needed a divorce, so he left the church, and he created his own church, the Church of England, or the Anglican Church. We'll see. There'll be some others. All right, how are we doing for time? Four o'clock. That's a good place to stop. All right, thank you guys so much.